I'm sure you all enjoy Saturdays and Sundays probably more than you enjoy Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays. Is that true? You probably like the weekends better. Why do you like the weekends better? Because you're not going to school, right? Less homework, less things to do, right? It's basically, it's because those are your two days off, right? Saturday, Sunday, the way your school probably works is you get Saturdays off and you get Sundays off. And those are probably the only two days off a week that you really say, okay, no schoolwork. Well, even that, you probably have a little bit of work. But for the most part, you're off of school. Have you ever thought about when I get a day off? You ever thought about that? Wait, he... Because my big work days, right, are Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Have you ever thought, oh, well, then he, there's no weekend for him, right? Oh, you've never thought about this. You've just, you've just always worried about your own schedule, right? You never thought about mine. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, But if you ever thought about it, I get a day off one day a week. I I have a day that I try not to do any work on, at least, um, you know, church work. I try to maybe do some homework those days, but that's Monday, okay? Your worst favorite day? is my favorite day, right? The day that I get to relax is the day that you guys have to go back to school. Sorry about that. Uh, But think about it. You might be like, wow, I've never even thought about that. The dude gets Mondays off. That's weird. What does John do on his days off? Well, I basically do one of two things. I either do homework or I go play golf, okay? Those are my two things that I usually do. Sometimes I do both in one day. Um, But usually you'll try to find me... um, playing some golf. Last week, I went and played golf with my, my brother and with my uh, roommate from college. We went down to Oceanside, and we played golf at this course called Goat Hill, right? And it's a lot like what it sounds. There's no goats, I don't think. Um, but it's this really hilly little short course. It was pretty fun. Um, we got there at 10.30 a.m. We played 18 holes really fast, but none of us had breakfast, and none of us had lunch. So, and we didn't even drink any water that day. We were all really dumb. Um, we had like nothing. So we were like starving and tired and like complaining, like, oh, I'm so tired. Um, so after the round of golf, we played 18 holes, right? That's what you're supposed to play. You're supposed to play nine holes and then nine holes. Boom, that's 18 holes. We went to Pedro's Tacos, okay? You guys know Pedro's Tacos? That made me feel very good. Okay, I'm like, okay, I got my food. I'm fine. And we're going back to the car. My friend Matt, um, my roommate from college, he's the one who drove. And we go back to the car. My brother starts feeling his pockets. And he tells us, he turns to us with a face like, oh, oh no, I left my keys at the golf course. We have to go back. So we had to turn all the way back and go back down to Oceanside to go get his keys. Now, as we were driving down there, we started to think, wow, we're, we're going we're gonna to get back to Goat Hill Golf Course and we're going to we might want to play golf again. And we're like, no, we'll probably be fine. We probably won't want to play. We, we step out of the car. We see the green. We see the driving range. We smell the grass. We see the putting green. We hear the music, which is a weird golf course. They play music off for their clubhouse. It's not very um, upper class. It's pretty blue collar. But we're playing music, and we thought, we got, we got to do this again. It was 2.30, and we said, okay, we played 18 holes this morning. Let's just go in and see what they'll say. So we see if we can play again for cheap. We go in there. They're like, yeah, you guys played earlier. We'll give you a cheap rate. You 15 bucks and play again. And we're thinking, oh, oh the rest of the day, cancel everything. We're going to play again. So then we played another 18-hole round. We played 36 holes that day. Um, probably wouldn't have done it, though, if my brother didn't forget his keys at the golf course, which it's like, how do you forget your keys? He left them on the golf cart, right? And the worker had it, and we called, and it was all good. But... I never would have played golf again unless I was in that situation. I probably wouldn't have gone back up um, at home and been like, you know what? I really want to play golf again. But when I got to the course, I saw the greens. I smelled the smells. I was like, oh, I was, I was tempted. Today, in the book of James, we're going to talk about temptation. And although temptations to play golf a second time are not any big deal, what we are going to talk about is a big deal. That there's a way that you can see something, fixate on it, want it, and get it. And God says that that's not a good thing for some things. For temptations to sin, temptations to play golf again, not a big deal. Temptations to sin, that is a big deal. He talks about that in James chapter 1, verses 12, all the way down to 15. So if you've got a Bible, let's open there. James 1, verses 12, 13, 14, and 15. You might be like, John, we are covering so many verses today. This is the most verses you've covered in a single day in the book of James. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Four verses. We're awesome. We're charging through this book. James 1, 
We said in verse two, right at the beginning, right after James introduces himself in the audience, he says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. We said, okay, that's, that's kind of a weird thing to say, right? When you're going through hard times, count it full joy. Be totally happy about what's going on when you're meeting hard times, trials. That's a weird thing to say, right? And we said, okay, why did, why did he say that? He said, because the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Basically, he's saying God has a purpose for every hard time. So you don't have to face hard times being sad about it or depressed about it. You got to face hard times with joy saying, yeah, I know God has a purpose for this pain. He talks about trials. He talks about wisdom. He talks about pride. And then he's going to go back in verse 12 to the idea of trial. So remember the audience, remember these guys, Jewish Christians, they were persecuted. They were not treated well because they were Christians. They were actually pushed down. Some of them got kicked out of their families, got kicked out of their towns, were on the run. That's the audience, right? Check out verse 12. It says this, this is James talking. He says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trials, right? Blessed. That's like kind of a, you know, Bible-ish Christian-y word. Like, what does that mean? Right? Remember back in, um, in Matthew chapter 5, when we um, studied eight sermons um, in the beginning of the book, or at the beginning of the summer, um, the sermon series, Hags, Have a Great Summer, right? Where Jesus talks about how to have a great summer. And it said, blessed is the one who does this. Blessed is the person who is this way because they're going to get this, right? Blessed or blessed, that's a Bible word that means happy, okay? But it's not just like, oh, that person would generally be happy if that happened to them. No, it's a pronouncement. God is making a promise. I will make this person happy if this happens. So we've got some supernatural godly happiness that comes along with this, but he says, blessed is the man. God is going to make sure this person is happy. The person who remains steadfast, right? That's what we talked about in verse four of this chapter under trial, which we talked about in verse two. This is what's new though. He says, for when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And then he kind of shifts gears a little bit. Right, we said right at the beginning that the word trial and the word temptation are really the same word in the original language. But there's definitely a difference in what he's trying to say. He says, okay, trials, that's something that God can put you through. But look what he says about temptation. A little bit different. Look what he says in verse 13. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am being tempted by God. So, okay, the Bible's clear. We can be tested by God. Our faith can be tested. But temptation, that's something different. This verse is super clear. God does not tempt you to sin. That is not God's purpose through your pain. It is not to get you to sin. We talked about God's purpose for your pain. It's to actually get you to start doing the right thing more often, not to get you to do the wrong thing. So God's purpose for pain is not that you would sin. Why? He says, for God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. If he wasn't clear enough before, God cannot be tempted and he does not tempt anyone. But how does temptation happen? Look at verse 14. He says, this is how temptation works right here. But each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desires, right? By his own desires. So temptation is not something that always comes externally, right? It's not always about someone pushing bad sin on you. It's also coming from within you, which says something about us. It says that we ourselves are sinful. We're not, we don't start out as good people. We don't start out, you know, as a blank slate, tabula rasa, right? None of that stuff. You might've heard that stuff in school. That, that's not the way that we're programmed. We're not programmed as good people. We're actually programmed as sinful people because this temptation comes from our own desire. Verse 15 says, then desire when it has conceived, right? He gives a little uh, baby illustration, right? We give baby illustrations sometimes, but this is what he says. When desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. So the result of you doing all the things you desire is sin. And then he says, when sin is fully grown, right? When sin, you keep on sinning, guess what that brings forth? Death. When sin is reaches its end point, it's death. Talks a lot about temptation here and a lot about how to fight it. And I got, I want you guys to understand temptation. Really, that's, that's something I don't think we talk about all that often. How does temptation work? And I don't just want you to know how it works. I want you to prepare for temptation when it comes. And even more than that, I want you to fight it when it does come so that you can win. And he gives some reasons for that in the text, but I want to look at verse 13 again real quick. He says this, in verse 13, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. Here's the thing. Because we're sinful people and because we are often tempted, here's what we want to do usually. We want to take our sin problem and make it someone else's problem. We want to take 
the things that we do wrong and we want to blame them on someone else, right? We call it blame shifting, right? When, you know, you do something wrong and, you know, your parents come at you, it's like, no, well, this person did it, so I thought it was okay, right? We're always wanting to do that. That's what he's saying right here. Some people in this place were saying, I'm being tempted, but guess whose fault it really is? It's really God's fault, right? I think we could feel that way too. Maybe if not God, you might want to blame your sin on someone else. It's my friend's problem. It's this person that tempted me to do it. It's this thing's problem. It's not my problem. It's, you know, it's my biology's problem. It's not, you know, really who I am. It's just, you know, the way that I was made. Well, God is not giving you that excuse. And in James 1, James doesn't give us that excuse either. Point number one, I want you to do this. Take ownership of your sin guilt. Take ownership of your sin guilt. Take ownership. What does that mean? It means that you, does that mean you're proud of it? Does that mean you love to wear it as a badge of honor? No, but it means that you own up to it and really realize that it's your fault. Basically put, sin is your fault, okay? Your sin is your fault. Other people's sin, it's, it's, it's their fault. It's their problem, but your sin is your fault. I don't think we're quick to admit that. And I think our culture wants to feed you to say, well, everybody... Everybody, you are a victim of someone else's problem. You are a victim. There's got to, someone else did something wrong to you and that's why you do bad things. It's not because of you. It's not because of your fault. It's someone else's fault. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says our sin is our fault. Don't try to blame shift. Don't try to make it someone else's problem. S- certainly don't try to blame God. You might say, well, I feel like I'm, I'm made this way. How, how could I not blame God? He's the one who made us, right? Well, Sin was not a part of God's original design for you, okay? Sin was not a part of God's original design for you. We know that in Genesis chapters one and two, and then we see how that, that, that perfect image that God made us in got messed up in Genesis chapter three. I actually want to turn there real quick. It's a pretty easy one to find, so I think we can all turn there. Genesis chapter three. I want to show you what sin did, the problem of sin, and even how Adam and Eve blamed other people for their sin right from the beginning. You get that whole blame shifting idea. You do it too. I'll prove it to you if you don't believe it. Check it out. Genesis 3, it's based, page 3 in my Bible. It's probably page 3 in your Bible too, or page 2. If you got like a really small print Bible, we got to take the microscope out. Right? This, you got one of those? Yeah. Then it might be on page 2. Genesis chapter 3. In the first seven verses here, Moses, who wrote this, is describing how this sin took place. But in verse eight, talks about Adam and Eve's reaction to sin and how they treated God after they had sinned. Look at verse eight. It says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Right, some weird thing. God's manifesting himself here. He's hanging out in the garden and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. So, they're hiding from God in the trees like God's not going to see them, right? It's like, um, you ever been in class and your teacher leaves the room and everyone pulls out their phone? When the teacher comes back, they'll just, oh, you know, put their phone away. Or, or you're, you're on your phone and you shouldn't be and then like someone comes in the room and you're like, toss it. It's like, well, I'm not, I'm not texting anybody. I'm not doing anything, right? That kind of feel, you've done it too. Just admit it. Uh, you, you've done that in class or whatever. You pulled out your phone or whatever and you're hiding, right? Or when you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, right? Or, or your, your little siblings at the cookie jar, right? And they hear mom and dad coming down the stairs and they're just, oh, put the cookie jar away. Like, no, I'm not supposed to have this, right? That hiding that we have from our sin, it's right here, right? This is, this is the beginning of all that. Adam and Eve, they're hiding from God, acting like he won't see them. Drop down to verse 12. How do they respond when God says, yeah, you shouldn't have done this. You sinned. Verse 12, the man, this is Adam, says this. He says, the woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and then I ate. So what Adam does, the first thing he does is he blames Eve. He's like, look, it wasn't my fault. Eve is the one who ate first. And guess what? He's, he, he's right. Eve did eat first, but he's not right to blame her. Because Adam was supposed to say no to this, but he said yes. He did what Eve wanted him to do, even though that was wrong. Just because someone else presents you with an opportunity to sin doesn't mean that your sin is their fault, okay? They're definitely, you know, involved in that and they shouldn't do it. But whenever you sin, it's, it's your fault. You can't blame other people. Even if other people are presenting you with that sin, you can't blame them. You have to take ownership of your sin guilt, which means if your friends want to do something bad and you do it, right, you can't say, oh, well, they did it, so I thought it was okay. No, it's, it's, it's your problem. 
Right? You can't say, oh, these people were watching this or doing this, so it wasn't a big deal, and I thought it was okay because they did it. Other people did it. No, that, that's not how it works. Your sin guilt is your problem. He shouldn't have blamed Eve, certainly, but really what he does, you see what he does there? He says, the woman who you gave to me. You see he's talking to God like that? He's saying, God, you gave this person to me. You gave this temptation to me. It's your fault. That's really what he's saying. What does Eve say? It says, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. See how they are blaming other people, right? The truth is we do that too. We try to blame other people and even worse, we sometimes try to blame God for our situation, right? You might say, I don't blame God for my, for my sin. Well, I don't blame him for that. Well, when you say phrases like, well, you know, it's just my problem, just the thing I struggle with, it's just my certain sin, right? What are you saying about the God he made you? Oh yeah, it's, it's his problem. Or if you say, you know, I'm, I'm just born this way. I just feel like I should sin in this certain way. I feel like I should do this certain thing. I just have these desires in me. You know, it's just how I am. It's not really my fault. Yeah, it is your fault. It's a bummer that uh, over the last couple hundred years, uh, people, even especially psychologists, have tried to uh, always sidestep responsibility. They say, oh, well, it's not you, it's your, your subconscious. It's not you, it's this. It's not you, it's, it's that. It's you. That's what the Bible is so clear about. Don't, don't be fooled about that. Your sin is your problem. You might say, well, if God really cared, wouldn't he like help me out with this whole sin thing? Wouldn't he want me not to sin, right? If God doesn't tempt people and he's not tempted and his goal is not for me to sin, isn't he supposed to help me out? Yes, he is. Good question. There's the answer. Yes, he is going to help. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which is a really important verse on temptation. Maybe one of the most famous in all the Bible about temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Here's what it says. Paul says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. What that means is, Paul's saying, there's no temptation that you have, the temptation to lie, the temptation to lust, the temptation to have say bad words, the temptation to do bad things. None of those temptations are unique to you. It's common to man. Everybody, not everybody struggles with all of your temptations, but in all of your temptations, there's someone else that struggles with that. Okay? Why does he say that? He says, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, which means if you're a Christian, you do not have to sin. You never have to sin if you're a Christian, ever. You don't have to. If you are in Christ, the power of sin is broken, as the book of Romans describes, and you'd never have to sin. So what does that say when we do sin? It's our fault. It's, it's not my neighbor's fault. It's not my parents' fault. It's not my, you know, the way that my body's made's fault. It's not, you know, puberty's fault. It's my fault, right? That, that's, that's the idea there. It's nobody else's fault. He says, but with that temptation, right? Because God's not going to let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, God will also provide a way of escape. Or escape, as Dory says. Way of escape. Right? Even think of that scene. Remember Dory with the, with the escape, right? What was the idea? She's trying to get out. Trying to get out. There's a way of escape. Right? That's what God is promising for you when you're tempted. When you are enticed to do something that's wrong this week, something you know you shouldn't do, God says, with that temptation, guess what I'm going to provide, right? God's not providing the temptation, right? But God's going to provide a way of escape so that you can escape it, so that you don't have to sin, so that you do not have to do the wrong thing. He said he's going to provide the way of escape so that you may be able to endure it. You may be able to do the right thing. That word endure reminds us, uh, of James chapter one, verses two to four, right? God wants to produce in us endurance. He wants you to not sin even when you're tempted to. This verse says that God is, is holy, right? He, he's completely set apart from sin and that's something you should know about God. Before we get any further, this verse is really important because it tells something important about God. It tells us that God cannot be tempted. God is so far removed and that's what the word holy means, right? That's a word we throw around a lot, but what does that actually mean? It means that he's so distinct or so different but how is he different? He's different that he's, that he's better than us. He's good. He's so separated from sin. Like we're, we're so entrenched in sin and he's so far removed. That's why, uh, you know, when we think of purity and holiness, right? We think of pictures of like a, a white dress, you know, compared to, you know, a dress that's all scummed up with uh, yellow and brown, I guess. Um, just various bad green. I'm not describing Mackenzie's shoes. I'm just describing. Um, I'm not, I'm not. I'm just describing... Imagine a, a, a white dress all messed up, right? That, what's the difference there? 
Hey, let's, let's stop that. Let's not throw stuff across the aisle, okay? Yeah. Um, but that difference, think about that. That difference between good and bad, sinful and righteous, that's the difference between God and between you. That's, that's the big difference. He can't be tempted, so he doesn't want to tempt us. I said earlier that God allows us to be tested, right? He tests our faith. That's the whole point of James 1, 2. God is going to let your faith be tested. But think about that. Why would God allow that to happen? I thought God wants the best for you. Why does he allow your faith to be tempted? Well, the reason he allows your faith to be tempted, or to be tested, sorry, not tempted. The reason that he wants your faith to be tested is so that God can help prove to you what God already knows, right? Does God know if you're a Christian or if you're not a Christian? Yeah, God knows that, right? But maybe you don't know that at this point, right? Here's what these tests are going to do for you. It's going to help you know if you're really a Christian. It's going to prove to you how you respond to certain situations that God allows you to be tested in. That's going to prove to you whether or not you're really in Christ or whether or not you're just not in Christ. So what's the point? Well, you can't blame anybody else for your sin. You got to take ownership of it. It's not God's fault. It's not your neighbor's fault. It's not your parents' fault. It's our fault when we sin. It's my fault when I sin. And if temptation's coming, right, I said this at the beginning, but if temptation's coming, right, I want you to be prepared for it. I don't want you to not be ready for it. Sin says in verse 14, and back in our passage in the book of James, James 1, 14 says, this is how temptation really works. It doesn't come from God, but it comes when each person is lured and enticed by his own desire. So it comes from within. It doesn't come from without. It comes from within. Basically, here's, here's what I want you to do. Point number two, I want you to know how temptation works so that you can beat it. I want you to know how temptation works so that you can beat it. I don't want to have a conversation with you about temptation just so you can write some notes down and store it away and never look at it again and don't think about it again. I know that you're going to be tempted today to say things that you shouldn't. And you're going to be tempted today to talk about people in a way that you shouldn't and do things that you shouldn't and think ways that you shouldn't. You're going to be tempted today There has never been a sermon that is more applicable to you than this one right now because you'll be tempted today. What are you going to do about it? I want you to beat it. I don't want you to just know these things as as theory or Bible verses. I want you to know them as experience. Did you know that some of the pastors um, going on a fishing trip with some of the men from the church, they do this every once in a while, right? They go away. um, They go, I think they go to Mexico. Um, They don't go to Mexico to go out. They go like out of San Diego and they go on these boats and they're out in the middle of the ocean, but like they're in Mexican water. So they got to have their passport and stuff. It's pretty epic. And they sometimes, Pastor Pete has the pictures and he's got this big, you know, big fish. And I always think like, dude, how did you get that fish like in the boat with a little wire, like a little fishing wire? Really? How, how did you get them there? Right. And then I think about it, right. The words here for um, he lured and he is enticed by his own desires. Those are fishing words. Okay. Those are used in the original language. When they talked about fishing, these are the words that they used, right? It's like he's saying hook, line, and sinker, right? That's an expression that we use, right? We, we hook them, right? You pull them, and I, I don't really know what hook, line, and sinker really means, so I can't really even pretend like I know, but it's a fishing analogy for I got them, right? These are these words right here. I want you to imagine that they go out on that fishing trip, and they take the, uh, what, the iPhone XR or XS or whatever, right? Not R. XS. Sorry, it came out this week. I'm behind. I haven't watched the Apple film yet. I'll go and watch that later. But you know how they, they show it and it's like, this, this deluxe iPhone has more, more technology put in into it than in an, the entire NASA spaceship, right? That, that's, that's how they talk. So to me, when I look at that, I think, done. Got to have it. Pull, pull out. I got to have this. This is the best thing that's ever happened, right? But I want you to imagine, right? I throw that um, iPhone, drill a little hole in it, put a, a hook on it, throw it out into the ocean. How do you think I'm going to catch those fish? You think it's going to be good? It got me, right? It got me to spend the thousand dollars, right? You think it's going to get them to just bite on it? No, no, it won't do it. So think about that. When you fish, you got to throw out things that the fish want. Right? You're not going to put pieces of pizza. You're not going to put iPhones. You're not going to put Instagram followers on the end of a uh, on a stick or whatever. <laughs> That's not how you're going to catch fish. <laughs> that got really metaphorical, right? I was like, yeah, you're not going to do that. What are you going to put on there? You're going to put on the anchovies, right? Which you, you grab the nose, right? And you, you grab the nose and you put it through the nose and then you, whatever. Um, 
They like that. They like that. The fish like it. I don't like it. I don't even like fish. But they like it, right? So I'm going to throw in the water what they want, not what I want. That's what this is saying, that your desires are going to get you where you want it, right? Your desires, you're going to be tempted to do things that you want. You're lured in, right? That's the idea of you've got something and you're trying to bring it across, right? If you're trying to, you know, get your dog to come over and you got the ball, like, come on, come on, dog, or whatever you call your dog. Probably a more affectionate term than dog. Um, <laughs> But you're, but you're trying to get them to come over, right? right? That's the idea of luring them. You're trying to get them from one place to another. And then enticing, that's the word for fishing when you've got the fish like on the net, right? You lure them into the net, but then you get them in the net. You've got them on the hook. Lured, enticed, right? Getting them there and then boom, when you entice them, you've got them, right? That is what temptation does to you. It lures you in slowly, right? There's a process, right? You gotta lie to yourself. You gotta act like, oh, this sin, oh, it's really gonna be good this time. Well, there's nah, there's not gonna be consequences for this. It lures you in. Oh, this looks really good. I should really say this. I should really do this. And then boom, once you do it, it's got you. That's how temptation works. I want you to know that so that you can beat it. Then it says at the end of these verses that sin, when it's conceived, brings forth death. That's an intense picture that the person who sins and does the wrong thing, that person deserves to die. Is that really what the Bible says? It is. Romans chapter six, verse 21 says, what was the fruit that you were getting at the time where you're doing the things which you're now ashamed? The end of those things was death. So he's saying, hey, the kind of life you're living as a non-Christian, what's the end of all that? What's really gonna be the fruit, right? Uh, the, the result of all that. What's gonna be the produce of all that? Well, death. If I really am going to live for myself and live in sin, guess what the result is? It's death. Verse 22 says, but now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, right? There's always that, that the paradigm shift we talked about last week. If you're really set free from sin, you're going to be a slave of someone else. You're going to be a slave of God. That fruit, which you get now leads to sanctification, it, its end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But you probably heard that last verse before, but I wanted to show you what led up to it. Talking about the wages of, of sin, right? what the fruit, the produce of giving yourself to sin and doing sin, acting like there's no consequences. Guess what? The consequences are big and the consequences are death. The Bible is so clear about that. So how do we fight it? I think there's, there's two main ways I want to look at this. Okay, He's using fishing analogies. I'm going to give you a, a sports analogy. Okay. I want there to be some offense and some defense when it comes to temptation. So the offense, how do we prepare? How do we get ready to fight against temptation? I need some offense right here. What does the Bible have to say about offense to temptation? Well, first thing I think is super clear. When we look at the time when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, right? Think about that. Remember Satan comes out and tests him in the wilderness for, for 40 days. He doesn't eat. He doesn't do any of that. And he's just getting tested by Satan. He's trying to throw things at him different temptations. Jesus always says, no, no, no. But you know what he says when he says no? He doesn't just say N-O or N-A-H. He doesn't say nah. Um, that's not what he says. Here's how Jesus responds in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, verse 7, and verse 10. Three different times he responds. And each time, first time he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 8, 13. Then he quotes Deuteronomy 6. And then he quotes Deuteronomy 6 again. So here's how Jesus responds to temptation. He quotes the Bible back to that temptation. So he has filled his mind. That's the first offensive strategy. You need to fill your mind with the Bible, okay? That's how you're going to fight temptation. If you're really going to be successful, you need to fight temptation by filling your mind with God's word. And I think it's funny um, that in the wilderness, Jesus doesn't have to bring out his, um, his Bible app and say, hold on, hold on, Satan. I got the, I got the verse right here. Let me just, let me find it. I know um, it's somewhere here. One of the books of the Bible, uh, Genesis, Exodus, uh, Deuteronomy, it's the fifth book. He, he doesn't do that, right? Um, he doesn't take out his scroll. It's like, hold on, hold on, Satan, give me a break. Hold on. I need to look this up. I need to look this up. No, he doesn't do that, right? And you think that's funny. It's like, yeah, Jesus didn't do that. But do you know what Jesus did? He already had it in his brain. And he said, no, and he, he knew it. He had already filled his mind with the word of God and he was able to say, no, I'm not gonna do that sin because of this. I wanna think about that with you for a second. Have you ever memorized some Bible verses that have to do with a certain temptation that you might fall into? 
Have you ever memorized a set of verses and saying, okay, I struggle with this. I need to memorize verses that speak to that. Because here's the awesome thing about God's word. It speaks to every temptation. It really does. The Bible is sufficient, which means it is able to help us with everything. It doesn't, you know, it's not comprehensive necessarily because look, it's only this big, you know, it's not libraries and libraries full of information. It's sufficient. It might not be comprehensive, but it's sufficient. It's able to, to help us in whatever our problem is. I want to give you some examples of this. I don't have that many, but I just have some things written down. Um, if you struggle with these sins, you should memorize these verses. I have nine of them real quick. Um, for one, if you struggle saying bad words, you should, you should memorize Ephesians 4.29. Ephesians 4.29, you should memorize that. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. All right, you can write these down really fast. I'm going to try to spit them out fast. Um, but yeah, you might want to write some of these verses down. Second one, lying. Okay, if you struggle with lying, so with bend, bending the truth and saying something that's wrong. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22. That's awesome. It says lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. What about gossip? Okay. You struggle with gossip. I don't want to talk behind people's back. I want to, you know, keep myself from doing that. First Peter chapter three, verse nine. First Peter three, nine is a great verse for that. If you struggle with respecting your parents and your teachers and your authorities and your leaders, you struggle, oh man, I feel like I'm always wanting to be disobedient to them and, and be a goof off when I shouldn't. Memorize th this verse right here, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Right, you don't want to, it talks about respecting our authority. What about complaining? I think that's something we all tend to do. We all um, feel the temptation to do that. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Philippians 2, 14. Do all things without grumbling or complaining. What about anxiety, right? The sin of anxiety, which by the way, anxiety is a sin if you, didn't, if you didn't know that. Worrying about things that you shouldn't, that's sinful. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Pride, uh, that's something we talked about last week, but a great verse for that. It, it, James chapter 4, verse 6. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's helpful when we're struggling with pride. What about anger? Right? We always want to lash out in anger. James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Some of the best verses in the whole Bible. Everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Before you lash out, I hope that verse is memorized. James 1, 19 and 20. What about self-control? I just feel like I can't, I can't control myself. I feel like, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to control my feelings or my emotions or, or my words, or my actions. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 32, self-control. Those are just a few things. That's one of the offensive strategies. Fill your mind with the Bible. I think that's the most effective of the offensive strategies. Another offensive strategy for you, um, fill, your, fill your mind with anything else that's, that's good. So basically, don't fill your mind with stuff that's bad. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says this. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is commendable, whatever, if there's anything of excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. Which means, okay, if something is not honorable, true, just, pure, lovely, commendable, right? There's a big list of things there. That filter, though, it's kind of like a filter. Take everything you're thinking about and run it through that filter, right? Is this show, is it really true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise? Is there really any excellence in there? Well, if there's not, maybe I shouldn't be watching this show. What about music? Yeah, if these, these songs, there's really nothing that's all that great about these songs. And there's nothing true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable. It's really just bad things and, and bad lyrics about bad things, that, sinful things that sinful people do. And, and yeah, you probably shouldn't be listening to that. What you fill your brain with has a huge impact on your life. The people you hang out with, right? People who you hang out with who are not talking about things that are true, honorable, lovely, just, pure, Maybe you shouldn't hang out with them. This week, one of the projects that um, Nathan and I worked on um, was building a bigger uh, playlist selection on Spotify for the Narrow CBC. So if you didn't know that the Narrow has a Spotify account, we do. And you can follow the Narrow. And I think we have six playlists now of songs that reflect this right here, that reflect things that you can be listening to when you're reading, when you're doing homework and the reading, right? We have an instrumental playlist. So it's just, there's no words. It's just music. Some of them are like nice and peaceful and some of them are cool, um, better than that. Um, not to say that peaceful music isn't great, but we, I think we made six playlists for you to follow. So you can listen to it when you're doing homework, when you're in the car, when you're reading, whatever. Things to listen to. 
Okay, that's the offense. What about the defense? Okay, I think there's some defense that we can have when it comes to, um, comes to fighting temptation. In Genesis chapter 39, verse 12, there's a famous story of Joseph, um, the guy from the Bible, not the guy from worship. Joseph, um, who there's this lady who was trying to commit adultery with him and what he had to do was run out of the house. He was like, okay, I can't even be in this situation. I need to get out of here. That, that's what Joseph did. He had to. He said, I'm, I'm running out of the house. Right after that verse we looked at in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the next verse says this about sin. Here's what we should do when it comes to temptation. Flee. Run away. Don't even be in the situation. Get out of there. That's, that's what he's saying about temptation. It's in defense there. Fight it. Don't be there. Offense, defense when it comes to temptation. Well, you might be saying, well, why not just do the temptation? Why, why are we even fighting temptation? What, what's, the, what's the point in all that? I think verse 12 in our text in James chapter 1 helps us with that. Shows us here's the reason. Here's why we should really fight temptation. Check it out. Verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trials. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. I think we don't realize how much reward God has in store for us when we say no to temptation. Specifically right here, he has this reward for us when we endure, when we keep doing the right thing, even when we don't want to. He says, I've got the crown of life waiting for you. Point number three, you need to be motivated by God's good rewards. Be motivated by God's good rewards. Last week we talked a lot about God's good rewards is eternal riches in Christ. But today, there's one specific reward that I want to talk about. The crown of life. What does that mean? Well, the crown of life seems to be talking, in every passage that it's brought up, it's brought up a few times, but it's always talking about this. A phrase that you might have heard before, but it's talking about this. Eternal life. Okay? Eternal life. You might say, ah, okay, that's just like life forever. Like, I don't know if I want to live forever. That feels like a weird thing, right? Am I really going to live forever to infinity and beyond? Is that my life, right? How, how does that work? Aren't I, am I not going to die? Everybody dies, right? What does that mean? Well, eternal life is a gift that God gives to us and we'll experience it in its fullest when we die and when we get to be with Jesus forever. We'll experience it in its fullest, but it's also something that starts at the moment of your salvation. You begin eternal life at the moment that God saves you. So if you're a Christian right now, you are now in this stage of eternal life. If you're not in Christ, guess what? You're not experiencing et eternal life. You're still in a situation that the Bible says you're dead in sin. But what is eternal life? Okay? It's not just forever long. right? I think sometimes all we think about eternal life is, okay, it's just forever long, but maybe it's boring. Maybe it's cool. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's ups and downs. I don't know. Eternal life is forever long. That's part of it. But that's only half of it. right? The other half of this eternal life that we need to think about is not that it's just the length of time. It's also like awesomeness. Okay? It's eternally awesome. It's like uh, inf inf infinitely awesome. That's how great it is. So you know those moments that are just, you feel like you're on top of the world, right? Um, when you dunk on somebody, right? Which you can't do. So that didn't make sense. When you hit a dinger, right? When you're like Big Al and you hit a dinger. Um, that's a home run. Um, when you go to press juicery and you just have the first bite and it's just like, mm, yes, queen. Like when you feel like that, like, Right? You just have that moment where you feel like I this is the best like this is the best moment. You go to Cane's, right? You have the Cane sauce, right? Chick yeah, Chick Fil A. You can't have that. You can't have that real feeling of eternal life because yeah, just because the Chick Fil A sauce has an eternal life doesn't mean that that feels like eternal life. Um, yeah, it's it's Cane's for me. Sorry, uh, but that awesome feeling. You know how you that that amazing feeling, right? That's what eternal life is describing. It's better than Cain's. It's better than hitting a home run. It's better than falling in love. It's better than any of that. It's eternal life, which means it's eternally good. Not just a length of time, but a depth of how awesome it is. Eternal life. Jesus promises eternal life to a certain group of people. A verse that you've heard before, I'm sure. John 3.16 says this, for God so loved the world. It means God loved the world in this way. This is how God showed his love to the world. That he gave his only son. This morning, if you were in main service, you learned what he gave his son to do. He didn't just give his son to hang out. He didn't just give his son to have fun. He gave his son to live a perfect life for us and then die on the cross for us. That's what Jesus came to do. 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. But if you believe in Jesus, which means you trust in Jesus, you get eternal life, not just forever life, but awesome life, quality of life, not just quantity, but quality, an amazing, perfect life with God forever. Jesus said in Revelation 2, verse 10, he was talking to a church. He said, don't fear what you're about to suffer. He says, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. If you're faithful, if you stand that test, which is what James 1, 12 says, you stand the test. You're tested by the world. You're tested by God. You're tempted by your own desires. If you stand that test and you do what's right, guess what? God's going to give you eternal life, the crown of life. You might say, wow, I've failed though. I mean, I think about temptation, right? I have not been perfect. I have fallen to temptation. What do I do? Well, I think that key last phrase in James 1.12 is important. He says, this crown of life is promised by God to those who love him. God promises it to people who love him. The Bible is so clear. You prove your love to God by the way that you live. You prove your love to God by the way that you act, that you are steadfast. What happens when you fall? Well, in John chapter 21, we don't have time to turn there, um, but in John chapter 21, Jesus has a conversation with Peter, a guy who just sinned big right before, and he talks to him, and his questions to him aren't, hey, are you going to do a better job next time? Hey, uh, are, are you really a Christian? That's not the question that he asks. In effect, that is basically what he's asking, but he asks a deeper, more important question. He asks Peter three times, do you love me? Do you love me? The implication is, if you love me, guess what? You're going to do what I say. And then he keeps saying, follow me, tend my lambs, tend my sheep. That's a figurative way of saying, take care of this church. I'm going to leave you some responsibility here. I need you to do it. Even when you fall into temptation, Peter fell into some big temptation. He said to Jesus before Jesus was going to die, he said, Jesus, I will never deny you. Even if everybody else says, I'm not with you, Jesus, I'm sticking with you. Even if it means death today. Whoa, okay. Peter says that. And then guess what happens? A little slave girl comes up, just a little servant, maybe just junior high age girl comes up to Peter and says, hey, Peter. And he doesn't say Peter, he doesn't know. He says, hey, uh, weren't you with Jesus? And Peter's like, no, are you kidding me? No, I'm not with him. I don't know him. Then again, a group of people comes up to Peter and says, oh, I, I know you. Your accent gives it away. You're from Galilee. I, uh, you're one of them. He says, no, that's not me. And finally, a, another group of people comes up to him and says, oh, you're, you're one of his disciples. I know you. You're with him. And he started cursing. He started cussing at, at himself. He started bringing curses down upon himself. He says, I don't even know the guy. And right at that moment, the gospel writers say, he looked over and Jesus, as he was walking to be taken away, he makes eye contact with Peter. And he knows. He says, Peter left that. He went outside and he wept. Big, strong fisherman, manly man goes outside and he's bawling his eyes out. It's because he didn't prove that he loved Jesus. He acted like he didn't love Jesus. After all that, Jesus comes up to him, asks him three times, just as Peter denied Jesus three times, Jesus comes up to Peter and asks him three times, just in the same way, do you love me? And really that's going to be um, the question of whether or not you're going to fall to temptation, whether or not you're going to stand up to trials. It's the question of whether or not you love Jesus Christ. If you love Jesus more than your sin, guess what you're going to do this week? You're not going to, you're going to say no to sin. You're going to say yes to righteousness. If you love Jesus more than you love popularity, guess what? You're going to make up whatever sacrifices you need to make if it means not displeasing him. If you love God more than you love your temptation or your sin, you're not going to follow that sin. If you're a Christian in the room, you don't have to sin. Be encouraged by that. That no temptation is overtaking you. That's not common to man. But God is faithful to provide a way of escape. That we can be tempted by our own desires, but we have the ability now in Christ to say no if you're in Christ. I want that to be true of every person in this room. Let's pray.